If you're sick in the middle, that's normally where your arms are at the worst possible position. That would be triceps. So do extensions. Um, a lot of, you know, you can do lockouts in the power rack. You can do board press. But always remember, um, if you do board press and you start to heave it with your chest or shoulders, that's what you're primarily going to build, not your arms. Extensions, arm extensions, elbow extensions will build triceps. You could do elbows out, rollbacks, straight bar extensions, uh, anything, pull over and, and press, all these exercises. Push all of these up and your bench should take off. Always train your back. It never, in the beginning when a person is not very strong, you don't realize how important your upper back is. When the weights get heavy, you'll take them out and you, you'll lose your arch and, and your upper back. So you got to do a lot of upper back work, a lot of tricep work. And also remember, uh, when people tell me where their sticking point is, obviously they're trying maxes too often. Or you wouldn't, because uh, it it's really should change periodically. But uh, one way to break a sticking point is speed. Um, you ever wonder, if you could bench 200, you can bench 250, but you get stuck at 295. Why did you miss it? Is it too heavy or was it too slow? Strengths measured in velocities. So always think about breaking your sticking point. Besides building stronger muscles, also think of more velocity through the sticking point. Uh, that's one way to, to uh, break a sticking point. But basically, build up river back, your triceps, and, and uh, you know, just everything. Uh, I don't know what where you're at in training, but I'm a big a proponent of uh, dumbbells, uh, seated in all angles you can think of. If you look at these really, really strong guys, they're really strong. There's a guy here in Columbus, uh, does not work out here, but he does all west side. And I asked him what he did. He, he told me he does heavy extensions, heavy push-ups, heavy dumbbells. This guy is at 220, he's done, he's done 605 raw. I saw him take 215-pound dumbbells, roll back and do nine reps. That's why the guy commits 605. And so just think like that. Start really pounding the muscles on, and I think your bench will take off. Bench is easy. You know, it, it, it's a, a lot of people don't know how to bench. You lay down, in my opinion, a lot of people get lazy. It took me years to figure this out because I just lay down to get to the squat and the deadlifts. And, uh, but when you lay down, it is a lift. You got to hold your breath, tighten every muscle in your body, and you got to blast up like a push jerk, all right? It's, you got to keep your butt on the bench, of course, but it's got to blast out of there. So uh, just think like that, and hopefully it'll, I'll get your bench moving. Remember, seated press, incline, um, decline press, lots of dumbbells, lots of extensions, and I think I'll get it moving. You know, uh, years ago, um, um, Knight said that, uh, you know, a, a famous strength coach said, if you, um, if you can um, uh, bench press 300, doesn't mean you can seat, uh, stand press uh, 300. But if you can stand up press 300, most everybody will be able to bench 300, and that's very true. And the reason when you stand up and press, it builds up your upper back along with everything else. So really push the seated and incline press. Well, we normally use a lot of bands around our legs to pull the, the, the legs apart and to pull them in. But if you don't have that, um, do ultra-wide squatting. You know, I know a lot of people say, well, my power rack's not wide enough. Well, squat outside the power rack. That way you're unlimited how wide you can go. And ultra-wide sumo deadlift. Take your feet out to the plates. Always drive your feet apart, always. And that will build up the hips and the abductors and so forth. And that, that should solve your problem. Um, I would do a lot of sled work. Also walking sideways with a sled. All right, even cross-stepping. But sideways and then cross-stepping. So, um, you know, you, you say you don't have bands, and that's how I would do it. It's simple. You just got to do it, okay? Well, a trap bar basically is okay if you want to do shrugs, but this is known as the center of mass bar. And uh, because the bar, when you grab it, is going to be in the center of your body. So it's okay for building up your legs. Um, years ago, uh, we had a guy in our gym that couldn't deadlift very much, about 650, but yet he could beat me and Chuck Vogelpohl in trap bar deadlifts. But he was 100 pounds behind us in the regular deadlift. And so I realized back then, it, you know, it's good for leg development, but not back development. Too many schools use it, they're safe. They just need to learn how to deadlift properly. It, no lift is dangerous, uh, just less the trainer is dangerous. So learn how to deadlift. Like watch our uh, DVDs and listen to our podcast. 
You'll learn how to deadlift properly, and you won't have any trouble with regular deadlifts. But that's my opinion. Trap bars are okay for doing shrugs and, uh, you know, things like that. Everything has a purpose. Everything works, but nothing works forever. Um, well, definitely what I would do is sled pulls. All types, walking forward, walking backwards, walking sideways, um, pulling your sled between your legs, walking forward with the handle lower than your knees at the tremendous hamstring glute builder. Um, then a lot of upper body. Uh, anything you can do in weight gym, with upper body, you can do with a sled. Uh, use a second strap, you can curl it, uh, press it, tricep extension, upright row, external rotation, like, like simulating pushes someone's head down with the strap. Um, and uh, so I do a lot of that. Also for kids, you know, because at that age, you want them to start being able to climb ropes. Well, a lot of kids, of course, they don't have the hand grip or the strength. So have them, have them take, take a long rope, hook it up to your sled, and have a hand over hand pull that with a, with a, a rope about the size of a person's wrist. All right? That will really help. You want a bigger, you want something bigger, not real, real small. Um, and that's the, that's the first thing. Secondly, I would push a wheelbarrow. Uh, when I was 12 years old, this is hard to believe, but I was actually a block tender. I didn't have any money, so my job was a block tender. I would work nine hours a day. I had to load, I had to load uh, blocks, carry blocks, load them up on scaffolds, mix mortar in, in, and then in a wheelbarrow, and push it around and so forth. Well, I think because I did that just basic labor, which now would, I would call GPP, <laughs> um, at 14 years old in a contest, I cleaned your 260 pounds, went 140. I also deadlifted 475 with straps. And I believe that's how I did it. I also squatted 410 pounds. It was just general physical labor, which now we would call GPP. <laughs> so uh, that's that's definitely two things. Light dumbbells, a lot of push-ups, and if they can, chin-ups. If you can't do chin-ups, I'm sure you see people hook a mini band or a lighter band to the chin-up bar where you put your knees in it so you lighten up the method and you can actually do chin-ups. And I would do a lot of abdominal work in the very, very beginning. And mobility work. Make sure to have, have good mobility. Lay two before down to sit. They can walk down that two before. But check their balance. And um, and do hand and eye coordination. I guess if we're talking about in general sports, I talk about this in my rule three book. Uh, you know, can you catch it? Can you catch a ball? Can you throw a ball back and forth? You know, drills like that, just general drills. And uh, you know, the more a, a great athlete is good at anything. So the more things you can master, the greater you'll be. And you need to start it young because uh, as you get older, like if you take a girl, you take a five-year-old girl, you're going to jump on a four-inch balance beam, do a, a backward slip. You're not going to get your girlfriend's 18 years old to do it. Yeah. It just, after a while, your brain just says, no, I'm not doing this. So I hope that, I hope that helps. I cover quite a bit of stuff. Med ball throws, light med ball throws. Whenever you catch a med ball, you gotta catch and reverse it, catch and reverse. It's a reversal that works with med balls. So use light med balls. Make sure you got a med ball that you can catch. Do not do depth jumps. I hear this all the time. Um, you know, whenever we do depth jumps, everybody's talking. I, I had a person that got her leg broke, jumping on a 36-inch box. This, this coach is a freaking idiot, straight up. And um, But that person should jump on a 21-inch box. Off a, but, that's, but you should not do any depth jumps. It's fine for kids to jump up. I would do a lot of jump rope because it teaches timing. All right, a lot of jump rope. You can jump up on boxes, moderate boxes, twice a week, have them do 24 jumps on a nice, easy box and slowly but surely raise the box. Make sure they always land on the center of the box and not on the edge. Like, don't let them be scared. Make sure they land on the center. That's optimal heights. Do them very specifically. Um, I would always train in the morning, you know, basically from 7 o'clock to maybe 8.30. Then I would come back at 4 o'clock and do my second workout. All right, that's, slight, that's shy of 12, but I had no trouble doing it. And I normally did four major workouts a week, like we do, and then six small workouts. And I, it, I mean, I was fourth in the world when I was 52 years old, second in the squat. All right, so it worked great for me, and it works great for all my guys who will train like that. The people in my gym that train the most are the strongest. They do the most workouts. They are the very strongest uh, people. So, um, yeah, just don't go and do a general workout. It's just, you, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your mind. So, you want to concentrate on what you need. If you need tries, train tries. Need hamstrings, train that, whatever you need. Like, like I said, that's a good time to go in and do a couple, two sets of benches with two and a quarter for 20 reps. One close grip, one wide. Add that up. 
40 reps with two and a quarter is a lot of work. Same thing in the deadlift. Um, Diva would do uh, um, two sets of deadlifts four times a week between two and a quarter and 275. Uh, and he went from an 820 squat when sweatpants was as good as a suit to 1,010 world record. His buddy Steve Wilson out of Cleveland had an 810 deadlift but followed Matt into the same workouts. They were training together at the time and pulled, went from 810 to 865, weighing 265 in a meet. And that's what, those, that's what these small workouts can do. Two sets of dumbbells, high reps, you know, 25 reps. Um, two sets of push-ups to failure, change the angles. Um, so exercise like that will go a long, long way. I trained the same way when I was raw. I mean, there was no benchers for 14 years, no squat suits for seven. I was top 10 in all categories with and without gear. I trained it basically the same. Um, if you're a raw lifter, today now, you know, you, you see a lot of jacked up guys back in the 70s and 80s. Now you don't see so many because of the gear. And uh, I, I'm a firm believer. I don't want to fall into uh, where powerlifters are weak out of gear because it just doesn't make any sense. If you're a raw lifter, I suggest the one thing that made me really strong, I did six sets of six. Um, I work up each week. And then and when I couldn't, when it got fairly hard, I would drop the weight back down and do eight sets of eight. Then when it got hard, let's say I did 315 for eight sets of eight, I dropped back down and go 10 sets of 10 and work up. And then when I went back to six sets of six, I invariably could get to a higher weight every time than I did in a previous uh, workout with six reps and then also eight and tens. And then occasionally I would also take a single in these workouts. Um, I had a 340 bench and Bill Sino told me to do this. I used a very wide grip, illegal grip actually. I weighed 175 and I touched go to 450. And I'm not a natural bencher. And I benched 500 raw weighing 197 by doing the very same thing. When you bench ultra wide, do a lot of tricep extensions. If you're a narrower bencher, like Rick Wheel years ago, I watched Rick bench 551 raw right here in Columbus, Ohio at the Y Nationals. Um, if you bench in closer, you could cut out some of the tricep work. Add more delt front and rear and side delt work. And uh, far as squatting, just do it the very same way. Um, you know, train by the percents of the, the weights we're using right now for squatting is 80. Second week, 85%. Third week, 90 and if you can, do five sets of five for all these weeks. On the fourth week, of course, way back, start with 80, change the squat bar, um, and the deadlift. Also, raw lifters, everybody should stand on boxes when you deadlift. That's why no one can deadlift anymore except these freaking Russians. You want to stand on boxes. Um, uh, Tara Weber, I had her follow a girl. Uh, she went from, seven, my girl, uh, Sinead Conley, went from 700 to 730. And she went from, uh, well, five, 515 deadlift to 525 really easy. And I, uh, incidentally, I had Tara Weber do this <clears throat> up in Canada. Used the very same process at the WPO recently. You watched her squat 727, and she's a 165, and pulled 529. I believe that was a 28-pound PR. And how'd she do it? Doing all the rep five sets of five on boxes. Five, uh, add five sets of five, add weight each week for three weeks conventional. Then go sumo on four-inch boxes. Same thing. Start for weeks you can do. Go up for three weeks. On the fourth week, start back over. We use a five-inch camber bench bar and, a, and like a 10-inch box we stand on. That will put the bar, the, the top of the camera will touch your feet, but your hands are four inches lower than the ground. Now, if you don't have a five-inch camber bar, set the bar out on a high box, set out in front of your toes. This is like, you would call them code deadlifts. Eddie Cohen did a lot of deadlifts where the bar was in front of his toes. And uh, so you got two examples. When you finish the three, the uh, five sets of five, you roll right back to convince so the first box are repeated, just keep repeating. And that's on speed day after the 25 squats, five sets of five. I increased the NFL linebacker, um, John Kerr, who played for Ohio State. He went to Minnesota pro day. He had a 38 vertical of a 4.6240. He got injured, injured his back, and they cut him. He came to me to get uh, rehab, and then they try to move on to another team. Um, I was working with John for about five months. He went to Houston at a pro day. He had a 44 vertical and a 44240 4, in Chuck Taylor's. How I done this was, he did the same training we do, speed squatting on one day, max effort on the other. Um, and then the jumping was with kettlebells, ankle weights, or weight vests, or all three. We, every time we switched, a lot of the jumping, we would set on a lower box and jump onto the second box. 
And by doing this, that's how he increased his, uh, his uh, box jumps, which increased his vertical. It's ironic, I, I believe he went up 12 inches in the box jump, and that gave him 6 inches in the vertical. Now, I've tested other people, and the ratio is just about the same. So um, I actually like uh, box jumps more than vertical jumps. I know it's test the NFL. But I want to, people are afraid, anyone will jump up and touch a tag. A lot of people are afraid to box, jump on the box. They have inhibitions of hurting themselves. If you want to be a sportsman, you have to override inhibitions. So I like the box jumps, but nevertheless, that's how I did it. And jumping requires strong glutes, hips, calves, um, muscular coordination, body type, many, many things. A lot of people aren't good box jumpers just because they're not built to jump. But some of the greatest jumpers in the world are weightlifters. And Yuri Vardanian had a 12-foot, over 12-foot long standing um, long jump. And that's, that is sensational. Um, and along with this, because David Rigard went trained with him, David Rigard at a 198 ran 100 meters in 1041. And I don't know if you know, but Vasily Alexis, 352 pounds, run 100 meters in 11.5. 1152 is what it was, at 352 pounds. So that's the benefit of jumping. And, um, but that's how I build a vertical jump, basically. Years ago, I had a girl here getting her PhD in exercise phys. She worked with the swimmers at Ohio State and, and had tremendous success uh, while they used the reverse hyper machine. And uh, one thing that people don't realize, a lot of sports, you like, for, for instance, sprinting, you seldom ever see this, but you need a lot of ice, isometric glute work. So take, uh, well, you do regular reverse hypers sometimes, and other times hold the weight to the rear. Uh, do th a count to 10 um, on each rep, you know, and uh, for three sets of 10. And uh, that is three, set, yeah, three sets of three, that's 90% work on isolated glute work. Um, <clears throat> secondly, for the upper body, I only, when I worked with swimmers, I only worked um, um, lat work and triceps when you're pulling yourself through the water, and that was it. They've always, they always did sleds. Yeah, I had a girl who was third uh, in uh, Olympic triathlete here, and uh, I asked her what made her run faster and, and so forth, and she said this, the sled made her run faster, swim faster, and bike faster. So a lot of sled work. You need a, lot, a strong lower body, of course, and uh, really strong glutes. Uh, everyone forgets about muscular endurance, so see that reverse hyper. Well, too many runners tell me, I said, what's your big problem with running? My lower back gives out. Well, hell, you got a weak lower back. Just build it up, and you won't give out. Same thing with you guys. The only people that actually use slow eccentrics are Olympic weightlifters. Uh, basically, they drop down and everything. So the, the Soviet Union and the Bulgarians would do a, a, a slow eccentric squats at around, normally around 15% of the time. And uh, that would be the only reason. The only reason you want to do anything slow eccentrics is to build muscle mass. And you're always taking a chance when you build the muscle mass for slow centrics, you're also tearing down muscle, so you're getting sore. And you can have a dome delayed on a slot of muscular soreness. So it's a trade-off. You'll just have to consider it. Somewhere around 2000, uh, maybe a little bit later, Chuck Bogopoul moved up to 275 class. He was about 265. And we always box squat, of course. That's all we do here. And Chuck came in, and he worked up. We put 640 pounds of band on the bar. And Chuck worked up to 835 and box squatted that fairly easy. And I remember that day, I, I look at it. I'm spotting it. I put the weights on. I'm going, this is impossible. What I saw is, is actually impossible. But sure as well, it was 835. Another workout, he made 885, and it looked just as easy. Um, Chuck had a bad time tapering for me, so I could never get him to go through the late transformation phase. Uh, to come into a contest fresh. But at that point, I mean, you're talking over 1,400 pounds at the top. Normally, we squat close to that ratio. He did squat 1180 like an empty bar. Chuck also held the world record 1142-42 so a couple years ago, and he had the world record in the 220s at 1025. But basically, a lot of band tension on these boxes, and uh, but the, Chuck doing those two, two is basically two things that I, in my gym, I saw. And I also watched Vlad, the big Russian, um, when he was here. Vlad broke the world record squat, 12.50 of gear back then, and 9.25 in a deadlift, total 28.05. He, not that long ago, just caught 11.57 raw. Now, I didn't see it, but that's an amazing lift. But I did see him do a triple in the bit over good morning with 865 pounds. And that was an amazing thing. He has a lower back from another planet. 
I particularly, you know, if you're going to train by percents, um, Alex, you just can't make up some weight. You know, if you got, if you squat, that's where everybody would go wrong. If you squat 750 and you want to do 800 and now you train off 800 pound weights, um, even though you might be able to succeed at the percentages, but the bar velocity will slow down. You won't produce, you will not be producing the adequate force and you won't make any progress. So that's the reason that we always go by actual max. Um, I just mentioned, I set the cycle up though, just slightly more, uh, at 750 pounds for two girls, one in my gym here in Columbus, Ohio, and one in Canada. Her name is Tara Weber. She just won the WPO. And uh, I set it at 750 pounds. The judging was very strict. We went to Tennessee, but my girl went from 7 to 730, pretty easy. And Tara went from, my blank, I think, 680 to 727. Now, she's a 165. They both did exactly the same program. They trained it. At all, based on 750, they trained at 80% week one, five sets five, 85, second week, 90. They rotated back and forth like that, and they did all the deadlifts I've mentioned in this podcast many times on boxes, and uh, Tara's deadlift went from 501 to 529, and uh, she won the meet. But it's, it, it's not a coincidence. It's a training method that someone in Columbus, Ohio, could do what someone did 2,000 miles away, and uh, they come up with the very same results. So... Um, uh, don't go too crazy. If you want to take it up a few pounds, that's okay. But don't go crazy because it's, then it becomes hypothetical. Math don't work hypothetically. You know, just unless you're a theoretic physicist, and I'm not. So uh, I would just stick with the real game plan. Now, I, I have a torn ACL in my right knee. I don't lift anymore. But I tore an ACL, and I still competed for over 10 years. I never had a repair. I had a doctor, Dr. Knuckles here, or mm -hmm. kind of a team doctor. He, unfortunately, he's dead now. But I, I, I felt a pop. I thought it tore a hamstring. He goes, no, it's your ACL, which it was. He goes, yeah, give us some rest. You'll be fine. My, I had extremely strong hamstrings. Lo and behold, it never held me back. Uh, at 63, I did it to 675, weighing 217. And that's probably six or seven years after I tore it. Somewhere between 57 and 63, I know that. I don't know. Didn't Tony? Tony? Tony well, I'll... Uh, Vlad tore both yeah. ACLs and he come back to squat 1157 raw. So I hope that it's the hamstring. If you have a book, if you're lucky enough to have a book, Power in Sport by Comey, he, in that book, they will explain if you have strong hamstrings, you can just basically keep going with torn ACLs. And I did. Um, to give you an idea of what I think ham strong hamstrings are, and I could, I could report a lot of this, but a uh, former lifter, female, lower dot, first sprinter, then power lifter. She's world record holder, in, uh, in the 90s, squat of 567 and deadlift 534, went 100, um, 163. They took her to Ohio State, test her hamstring quad ratio. Hamstring 60, quad 40. I have people out right here right now who will test out the same way. But we specialize in hamstring and glute and hip work. And that's why. You know, I, I watch all these ball teams. I know football is a rough game, but all oh, these torn hamstrings. A lot of them are not even contact injuries. This is ridiculous. In Russia, the, uh, they would blame the coach for a torn hamstring of an athlete. I feel the same way today. So you just got to do a lot of hamstring work. That's everything in running and lifting and jumping. So that's my answer. A lot of If you train the calves, you'll support the hamstring um, uh, and the knee on the bottom. If you do a lot of hamstrings, you'll support it on both sides at the top. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Also, please, do a couple hundred leg curls of 10-pound ankle weights or so every day. That builds up the soft tissue, and that there's because he talks soft tissue does not have a lot of blood supply. Everybody talks about muscles outgrow soft tissue, like we take antibiotics here, where you go to Tarantino. This is the most dumbest thing. I don't know where these people get this. I guess I don't know where school he went to, but I get my money back. But did anyone ever think about tr training the ligaments and tendons? It's that simple. Train the ligaments and tendons with ultra high reps, a minimum of about 50 to 70. The Russians say. Um, I got it from a high jumper, and uh, she would do 200 leg curls a day. We do a lot of band, high rep band curls, high rep single le uh, standing leg curls, all this stuff. All right, so that's how that's how we compensate, and we don't have any of these injuries. When's the last time you saw a person pull? Have you seen a person pull hamstring? No. I haven't even seen one. The first thing I do, everyone, Glenn Mills, uh, everyone I've ever heard of pull sleds. Pull sleds. Um, for short distance, around 60, 60 meters is plenty. 
And if, if you're a long distance runner, poem for up to a half hour if you want. Lighter weights, of course. Always keep track of the time that it takes to cover the distance and try to break those times. Use three different weights. But that will be a great base. Do a lot of calf work. Do a lot of hamstring work, calf ham glutes, reverse hypers, inverse curl, uh, etc. Leg curls, band curls for soft tissue work. There's so many track athletes that get hurt. It is pathetic. I guess the coach figures, what the hell, I'll get another 50 people come in next year. That's no way to look at it, and that's not a coach. That's a maintenance worker. All he's doing is picking, you know, watching the athletes every day and knows he's going to get new ones next year. So you don't want to do that. Same thing with football. All these hamstring injuries. You know, the rush is if you pull a hamstring, it's the coach's fault. I agree. We don't pull a hamstring. Have you ever saw a hamstring pull in our gym? No. Nope. Never. I mean, 30 guys will pull 800 or more in 49. We don't have a hamstring pull. You know, it's, it's a, you You got to build a base. Like I talk about a pyramid. A pyramid is only as tall as its base. So you want to build a big base. And then uh, if you're sprinting, don't overrun when you... I'm, I'm, I'm writing an article about this right now. Too many people run too much. Like if, if I, I had a person uh, uh, that was going to run 100 meters, indoor 60 and 100, and they had to do 10 200s. That's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard of. If you go to a track meet, you're, you're lucky to have two heats in the final. That's three. Why would you do 10 200s? Uh, uh, people, you know, uh, track coaches, I'll tell you right now, you need to buy some books about Charlie Francis, Glenn Mills, and so forth, and learn how, learn how to actually be a track coach. Don't take it on your own advice. You know, it, it's ridiculous. You've got to, uh, uh, coaches have to grow just like athletes' abilities have to grow. If a coach can't grow, you'll never make a great athlete. You want to work up as fast as possible the minimum amount of volume to set an all-time record. Um, basically, in the deadlift, we would go to lower back exercises and trap exercises with high reps and spatial exercises. For the incline, I used to work up a lot of steep inclines. I would max out for a single, and I mean, actually, I could do 370. Then I would drop down to 315 to a rep record, 275 record, 225 rep record. That way, I got a lot of volume in afterwards, but I did it for hypertrophy training. But on the way up, you want to get up because you don't want to you know, just take a you know, wear yourself out getting up to a max single. I had a track coach in here showed me a program. To deadlift 405, it required 5,000 pounds to get to 405. I showed him how we would get to 405, but it was 1,800 pounds. So, you know, if you're a sportsman, you definitely want to get the most out of training. And if you're a track athlete or something, you know, you want to be on the track. You don't want to be in a gym taking two hours to deadlift. I also watch many, many people train and train way too slow. Max effort, now listen, um, as science tells us that your, your uh, serum testosterone rate drops in 45 minutes. If that's true, there's, and, but yet also studies tell you you got to take five, six minutes in between attempts. One of them's got to be wrong. In my opinion, it's the five or six minutes rest. It's got to do with your level of physical preparedness. If you're prepared, why would you wait five or six minutes? Jump back in every two, three minutes, max up. You know, in the gym, we'll be five or six of us taking like a rack pull. As we get higher, of course, some of them's going to fall out. So the rest periods actually get shorter at the top. But we always break our records as somewhere between 90 and 95% clip on max every days. Years ago, I followed this program for a long time, till uh, 19, about 1982. But uh, West Side Culver City would do three levels in a box squat. They did above, a parallel, a parallel, and a real low. Actually, their low was a metal belt crate, and I believe it's 10 inches. And that's how I followed that. And I actually did them all in one workout. Like I might work out to 750 and 700, and then on a, like it was a 17, a 15, a 13, and go down to maybe 650. And actually, I did four. I dropped down to the crate, and I would do three sets of triples down there. So I used three different or four different levels in one workout. Um, another thing, in the early 70s, you know, I squatted wide. A lot of guys, Larry Pacifico, me, Joe Weinstein, lots of guys squatted ultra wide with no gear. There was no gear. And, um, but they used a fairly close stance, and they sat down, and the, and, uh, the difference, it, there's not, not much difference. It, it produced the same way you sit, release the hips, rock back, go straight up. I want to bring up something, though, that's confused a lot of people over the years. They used to be called rocking box squats. What's a rocking box squat? Um, Bill West, the basic the founder of Westside Barbell at Culver City, was in the gym by himself one time, walked out, and he lost his balance and fell down and ended up going to the hospital. So he came up with white power racks. In the old days, if you looked, they called her called gorilla racks. 
you know, where 24, 26 inches on the inside. And then he added a box, and of course he had safety pins if he did lose his balance. But what they did was a lot of times they would set the bar on the pins, and a guy would sit like this, he would straighten up off the pin a little bit. His buddy would jerk him around the waist, rock him, rock him to see uh, back and then forward, and help him stand up at the first rip, an assisted first rip. That is a rocking box squat. Now, what we do, we sit back, I say release the hips. We don't call it a rocking box squat. We just sit back, release the hips, it goes straight up. But no assistance, no spotter assistance. So that's the difference. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, the question is, uh, box squats in 2019, no different than it was in 1969. It's the same thing. And uh, it's produced the greatest squatters of all time. I don't know why guys want to argue with it. Box squats, built, box squats teach you to drive force into the ground instead of yourself off the ground. And the reason is, uh, you squat wide and you drive it to the ground and push it to the bar to elevate yourself off the box. So I, I hope that clarifies everything. One other point, um, we've all got enormously strong hips. Uh, in the very beginning, my hips start out right my legs so much, I came up with two things, belt squats in the early 70s to, to uh, condition my legs, and also I use a hassock. It's like a, it's like a soft plyo box nowadays. And we would squat on that because you set, release, and so it's like, it's like squatting out of sand, and it, it causes more muscle tension than hip flexion. So that's how we supplement our, our leg work. And I would normally do a, 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 cy a three-week cycle about every four cycle. And today, we still do it today, a squat on a softball. You know, a lot of people, if you do um, static overcome by dynamic, place a bar on a pin and blast it off there, you're talking about speed reps. That will build explosive strength. We do this with my track athletes. Um, I use the Hoffman method where I pull a bar from one pin to, to hold it against the next. You don't want to hold it for three to five seconds. It's too hard on breathing. Just pull it up, hold it for a second and a half or so, put it down, and repeat. Maybe five sets of five, something like that. Uh, when you do isometrics, you know, I, you, you must know that where you pull the bar at that precise angle, where it works the best. It radiates out 15 degrees either way, but it diminishes. So you make sure you pull at your sticking areas. And um, uh, so as far as isometrics, you want to do true isometrics, you have to load a bar before it's unmovable. And, you, and again, just get it. Pour, uh, uh, one big thing about isometrics is people don't understand. When you grab onto a bar or you're going to bench it or squat it, you, you, you will automatically push yourself in a perfect position before you start to exert. So it's really a form builder as well. I believe these Russians do a lot of uh, isometric deadlifts as way they can get their pelvic into the bar. They had to be pulling on a, on a, a static bar, pulling yourself in a position. And uh, in a way, it's like PNF stretching. Anything you can do with uh, a person pushing you, you can do it on your own if you're smart enough. So uh, I would do a lot of isometrics. Um, a um, guy here in town could not deadlift 600 pounds. Uh, I won't bring his name up. Uh, he's a former guy, but he couldn't deadlift 600. And he come back the next week, he pulled six. And he's a 275 pounder at that time. So we put him, he stuck right off the floor. We put the bar on the floor, had him pull up against the pin just a few inches off, about three inches off the floor. Pulled up hard down, hard down, hard down. Sets of five. In two years, he pulled 800 pound deadlift. And uh, basically, he had just a, 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 just a terrible weakness and sticking point right off the floor. And that solved it. So um, I suggest you give him a, a lot of work. And, um, you know, you want to do a lot of isometrics for about two weeks, period, then get off of them for a while. It's like anything else. You can't do isometrics a long period of time. Also, it's been proven, uh, like, grapplers are real strong, but they might not be so strong with weights. But uh, I've done a lot of research. I've got a lot of research in the Soviet Union by p pushing or pulling on a bar at 50% of your maximum muscle tension for 20 seconds, you can become very, very strong. And I've done some of this, and that'd be also an alternative you might want to try. Me. <laughs> I, I, I had a mirror. I had a mirror in the AM radio. But then I started getting trainer partners, and I realized, but you just immediately know you got to spark the guy, you know. Back then, there was no gear. We had a power rack. We did everything in a power rack. No monoliths. I mean, I'm talking back in 1976 up till 1993 when monoliths came out. But you just, that's what training partners do. They work together. And um, it's just gym etiquette. I, I watch people, and they, they, they don't, I've had a lot of football coaches come here, 
He said one of the best things they learned, they learned how a group of people should train together by helping each other and spotting. You know, uh, taking the mat off the box for the next guy, changing the weight for the next guy in the bench, so forth, you know. So um, anyhow, I just, it just years of practice. I mean, I've done this all my life. Get good trade apart. Don't get a lazy ass. You do kick them out. I don't care if it's your mom. Get her out of there. Roll lifters, there is, just so you don't wear anything, there is no such thing as roll. They got knee wraps, they got four inch power belts. Um, they almost got rubberized singlets. So, but for injury prevention, in the very, very beginning, gear, supportive gear, was basically preventive injury prevention gear. But then it, as, a, as the manufacturers of gear got in, uh, you know, basically competition with each other, they started making better and better gear, could lift more weight, and any athlete's going to take an advantage. You, you know, you, you, never, you never take a knife to a gunfight. So if someone's got a better set of wraps or a better pair of briefs, you're going to buy them and going to take them. But it's the injury prevention. When I bring athletes in here, uh, all my athletes, when they're doing condition, uh, traditional lifting, squatting or deadlifting, um, they always will wear briefs. I'm not taking a chance of having an injury in the hip, hamstring, or low back, and that prevents it. And a lot of people talk about belts. Uh, you want to wear a belt. Um, the reason you wear a belt, it decreases inner abdominal pressure, which is decreases spinal cord pressure. So, uh, you know, it's funny. Powerlifting is a funny sport. They talk about roll, but I don't know why, because I don't know a sport, hockey, football, baseball, everybody wears some type of protective gear. You know, football, or hockey, I mean, look at hockey. You got to have 50 pounds of gear on out there. And football players got all kinds of stuff. But if you want to prolong your career, uh, that you need to do this. And, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, but again, it's for injury prevention. And it, yes, it makes you lift more weights. But have you ever thought of this? When you, if, when you put, a, if you could deadlift 405, you novices, without a belt, and you put a belt on, you do 435, how did that four inch belt increase? You did 30 more pounds. All right. But that means below the belt and above the belt, you had to do 30 more pounds of work. It would never happen if you didn't put the belt on. Same thing with briefs. If I put a pair of briefs on you, and you can squat 500 roll, now you can squat 575. Below the brief and above the brief is doing 75 more pounds of work than it's ever done before. And that's how you get stronger. We don't do our assistant work in briefs. We, we merely squat or deadlift, sumo deadlift, uh, or box squat in briefs, even with the conventional pullers just wear shorts. Burley uh, Hawk this morning, pulled 800, stand on a four inch box with no belt, no nothing. So there you go. Well, develop hip strength, in my opinion, wide box squats. You know, from high box to very, very low box of a wide stance. Um, you know, too many people squat on two high boxes. They go to meet and they bomb out and go, wow, it, it didn't work. Well, it didn't work because you've never seen parallel in your life. I've seen people squat on boxes. How I get in those bleeds. So you want to be able to squat on parallel boxes or below. Wide stance. Always drive your feet out. Ultra, ultra wide. Sumo deadlifts. And just pull a sled. Just general work and build yourself up. Um, that's the fast way to build your hip up. Well, I wish I'd known about the Soviet system long before. Um, I started doing the Soviet system in 1982, where I'd already lived there for 12 years. Had two lower back uh, severe injuries. One, I was on crutches for 10 months and uh, torn on my bicep. And basically, used progressive gradual overload training, which is taught in colleges today, which is at least 50 years obsolete. And uh, so um, I just wish I would have had access to that material uh, long before I did. Mm -hmm.